How is everybody doing? Strength Chat episode 146. And today I have got a very special guest for you. Today I'm joined by the co-owner of Kabuki Strength. He's also known as the mad scientist of strength. Today I am joined by the one and only Chris Duffin. How are you doing? Doing good. I, I really feel like I got to do my intro right now because uh, uh, <laughs> we have a podcast called Strength Chat too, and I always open it as Welcome to Strength Chat. <laughs> <laughs> I think anyway, I've been uh, I've been uh, listened to your to your podcast as well. Um, yeah, I think your intros may be a little bit better than mine. <laughs> um, how, how... Uh, they always make fun of me because it's a double intro because we've got like a pre-recorded one, but I just I can't start without it. So. <laughs> Um, how have you been? What have you been up to? What's been, what's been happening in your world? Oh my gosh. Uh, it has been, uh, well, we all know it's been a crazy year. Uh, but, uh, uh, I started off the year with, uh, finalizing kind of my, 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 my lifting career. Um, uh, I basically the day before things shut down for COVID, uh, I, uh, squatted a thousand pounds, thousand one for a triple, which was my, final feat of strength at 43 years old uh, and accomplished a big goal of mine that I'd been chasing for four years, which was to be the first person to squat and deadlift a thousand pounds and to do it for reps. And then uh, Kabuki Strength primary company has been getting swamped uh, because we, we make some incredible equipment that's uh, happens to be really, really viable in like a, a garage gym or private training studio because it, it can rapidly accommodate to a lot of different things very fast. So while it's a uh, uh, more expensive high-end equipment, uh, it is in that environment actually uh, lower cost of use because it does a l so much. And uh, February, uh, my my uh, my company focused on the human to ground interface, foot and ankle. Uh, we started uh, uh, selling shoes. We got into the minimalist shoe. And that has been taken off and doing really good. Um, uh, supplementation, a lot of people using a little less. So build fast formula is kind of down, down a little bit. Um, and uh, so it was really uh, working those. I've got another, another company ready to launch here before the end of the year. And we've got some incredible products uh, about to release that I'm really excited <laughs> for with Kabuki over the next two quarters as we kind of fill out uh, the rest of uh, reimagining what a gym can be if we actually take the principles around scientific principles around loading and movement and actually think about the equipment instead of just making the same old things uh, that everybody's been making. So uh, so we're going to get into handheld weights. And I use that term loosely because everybody jumps to dumbbells and <laughs> uh, get, uh, jumping into uh, kind of a multi-use rack and uh, pulley machines, again, that can do so much more than what we have uh, available out. So, so really exciting stuff. Oh, cool. And, so plenty, yeah. of, plenty of things to keep you uh, occupied then through. Uh, uh, through yeah. The and then, uh, you know, just a personal, I'm working on uh, uh, finishing out an epic uh, vehicle build I've been working on for a long time. It's got its own website and Instagram, but uh, uh, I, I love taking engineering projects and concepts and just doing things that, over the top like that's why they call <laughs> me the mad scientist right it's just a different but it all makes sense yeah. and it keeps yeah. everything interesting and keeps you um you know um keeps you thinking and and, and experimenting which i think is i think is uh, cool having a creative outlet uh and things that force you to continually uh be learning and exploring are just like really essential things for me as a as a human being i've got to have those in my life yeah um, so for everyone listening, obviously, you know, you've mentioned a, a couple of different areas that you're working in, obviously you mentioned a little bit about your training, which we'll probably dive into a little bit later on in the uh, podcast. But for everyone listening who might not know your background in training and um, in, you know, developing Kabuki uh, strength, just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself. Uh, yeah. So, uh, it, well, as far as the lifting side, I started lifting in 1988, um, I uh, went to school for dual engineering and MBA and spent uh, 20 years in kind of the industrial sector. Um, why was that relate? But I, you know, in, in the scope of it, uh, I managed the engineering teams as well uh, in aerospace, automotive design, all this sort of stuff. Um, so 
gave me some very unique perspectives as I shift over uh, experience in metallurgy and all these sorts of things that uh, uh, can come. And I've had my own training uh, facility. I built my own garage gym starting in about 2003. Um, so I started powerlifting in 2000 and I powerlifted till 2016. I spent uh, uh, eight years ranked number one in the world uh, for squat, deadlift, or total, uh, and set some all-time world records, my best being 881-pound squat at, uh, at uh, 220 pound body weight, which was the heaviest four times body weight squat uh, when I did it, and uh, opened my own commercial facility, I think, in 2008 or nine uh, on the side of my career, and then in 2015, uh, 2016. Yeah. That's when I retired from powerlifting and went full force into, uh, launching Kabuki strength and walking away from that prior career. So I just, it'd been too long. I felt I was, I'd learned so much and had done so much in that, uh, uh, professional career, but the knowledge and skills that I developed, I feel like I, I felt I could really have a huge impact in the fitness space and especially, uh, because I'd started developing relationships and knowledge and the people that I was working with were, you can check our advisory board. A lot of them are there now, a um, number of them, but um, you know, I developed a lot of relationships and uh, people I'd bounce knowledge off of and lecture with, uh, even though that wasn't my primary career were, <laughs> you know, like Stu McGill, the leading bio spine biomechanist in the world. Tomorrow I'm flying down to f spend time with uh, Dr. Kelly Sturrett, um, you know, probably the well, well-known uh, physical therapist, um, uh, you know, Craig Liebenson, the guy who brought probably the best developmental kinesiology, uh, program to the United States. Um, you know, these are, that's how I started mixing like the stuff yeah. of design and engineering to biomechanics and to loading and all this sort of stuff and, and came out of with this really kind of unique perspective that's adding stuff new to the world. So, uh, when I opened the commercial facility in 2008, I started building a lot of my own equipment. And so that was kind of the, how Kabuki strength started, uh, was launching basically a lot of the stuff that I'd started already building and had used and proven, uh, through the years. And, um, I decided to do exhibition lifting. No, I'm all over the place here, but, uh, so that's what I did for the next uh, five years. Um, so I switched from competitive powerlifting to doing different feats of strength. One, it, just allowed more creativity uh, and fit my schedule better because I had so much going on with launching being an entrepreneur yeah. and allowed me to raise money for charities that I believed in, which is a, a, a core tenant for, for uh, Kabuki. It's one of our four pillars. Yeah. And, and uh, so that's what I've been doing. I launched uh, Barefoot Athletics, uh, which is, you know, basically a minimalist shoe company and Build Fast Formula, which is a supplementation uh, company and, and, uh, I've got one other, uh, company about ready to launch. I think I mentioned, and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's how that all got started. So it was a weird yeah. mix of all sorts of stuff, uh, in the background, you know, being long experience, lifting mix of, uh, engineering, uh, designing equipment, uh, competing and just being able to, to interact and run these ideas around some of the best people around uh, and uh, get feedback in, in that, those development stages on uh, the concepts and stuff. So it's a pretty unique position to be in, honestly. Yeah. And so when you, when you see some of the content that you're putting out there, the different strings to your bow, that's why I found, uh, I, I find it really interesting um, every time that you're putting content out there. Um, and especially when you're speaking with, um, you know, the, the other coaches um, or people in the, uh, within the, uh, you know, fitness industry, if you like, um, or strength, um, uh, strength world, uh, the different perspectives that, that they can have. And then, you know, um, trying to put that in your own, um, put a, your own spin on it, um, which I find is really interesting because I know there's, you know, a couple of coaches that I'll follow that I'll all put different content out there. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's good to look through it and put it through at your, at your own lens. Um, obviously you mentioned about your, um, your own sort of lifting career and then, uh, started jumping into, uh, uh 
exhibition lifting or the feats of strength um, that you've that, that you've done yourself. Um, how did that differ to um, you know going into a powerlifting meet? You mentioned there, uh, obviously it fit a little bit better with your um, your schedule and everything like that. But um, you know the the lifts that you've done and you know for for charity. How did that differ to the training that you were doing when you knew you had um, maybe two or three meets um, a year? How how did the training sort of differ for that? Yeah, it uh, it varied quite a bit, uh, and it's really what allowed me to do these like unfathomable things, you know, like squatting eight hundred pounds every day or deadlifting four hundred kilo every day for 17 days straight yeah. uh <laughs> deadlifting a thousand one pounds for almost a triple uh these were you know you're just like that's fucking crazy you know if you went to a competition you total 2500 you know and it's like well no because <laughs> i'm only training one thing yeah and that was i was getting older time constraints so it really allowed me to optimize my recovery for this one area right so and also the fact that i also have decades of experience i mentioned i started training in 1988 um so i don't have to necessarily spend as much time on those other areas like it's not something that you would do in your first two years five years ten years or even 15 years of training to go well i'm gonna deadlift for a year and then I'm going to squat for a year, you know, like that would not be good. You'd lose a lot of movement patterns. Uh, you would probably have some imbalances, but it's like, I, I was at a point that I have really refined movement patterns. I've got a base level of strength and resilience built that allowed me to, to do this. And then doing that allowed me to tailor back my training uh, so that I could still push things in those other areas and still have the recovery necessary to pull this off. And particularly when it came to the final stages of training, uh, where it became so, so specific, where my only session was a squat session or a, de or a couple deadlift sessions yeah. per week, crazy volume. You know, we're talking like, you know, the final, uh, you know, three, four months of deadlifting, I was deadlifting from a deficit uh, and I said deficit, it was like two mats. So like, uh, you know, an inch, inch and a half yeah. um, between 850 to 800 pounds once a week for 12 to 15 repetitions total. And then in the second session, deadlifting from the floor uh, between 900 to 950 for 12 to 15 repetitions per week. <laughs> and the squat, I was squatting once a week, uh, you know, the final couple months, uh, the load, the average load creeped from 950 up to 980 uh, in a progressive manner with an average repetition of between eight to nine repetitions. Yeah. Um, so nutty. You couldn't be benching heavy or doing the, the opposite lift heavy in those periods of time. Just it would not work. It's not. I mean, what I did was crazy enough as it was. Um, but that's what allowed me to to be able to do that is really rethinking uh, the training. But outside of that, I mean, it was the the overall concepts were the same, right? Yeah. So it's you know kind of block periodization, right? And you've got and you're periodizing uh, not just you know sets reps, but actually the movements, um, uh, but also overlaying over um, you know keeping the same qualities. Uh, you know, that you've developed in the last block into the next block, right? So, uh, you know, if I'm in a, you know, a, a hypertrophy block, you know, like I'm early in this, earlier in the, in the season, like a year out, I'm going to be, you know, hypertrophy strength. I'm going to be working on developing the qualities that I know that I'm going to need, but less specific movements. Yeah. So it's going to be a lot of things like uh, good mornings, um, uh, things for developing uh, upper back strength to be able to support the bar. So I'm talking about the squat, right? So it's going to be bent over rows. Uh, it's going to be really challenging torso position. So using the transformer bar and very aggressive setting ranges during this period of time. So less specific. Uh, and then if I'm doing, you know, something in more of that hypertrophy side of it, you know, maybe I'll have a drop down set at the end of the session of a heavier weight to keep the strength qualities right. And then as the prog 
as I'm progressing, I'm going to take like the transformer bar and get closer and closer to more of a back squat, right? With each, each session, I'm going to start dropping out as I get to the end, I'm going to start dropping out uh, movements that are going to be taxing that I needed to develop, but now I've got those strength and I want to, so it's like, you know, the rows are going to drop out, right? Um, then I'm going to get even more specific and go straight to, you know, the, the, the duffalo bar, which is what I uh, perform the feet on. And I'm going to use that uh, as I'm getting there. So it's, I mean, it's basic training principles. It's just uh, changed a little bit uh, based on the the one singular goal instead of a larger development of a, uh, um, but as a whole, it's just using the same principles to look at it. You develop a program that is quite a, possibly quite a bit different looking at certain periods. Yeah. But if you understand those principles, you, it's pretty easy to piece together. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting when you say there, you know, the lifts that you've done, like it would have been, oh, you would have, you would have totaled a lot in a, uh, you mentioned it there, totaled a lot in a, a full powerlifting meet. Um, but one no. thing, oh, well. No, my, be- my best, my best squat was 881. Obviously that was at 220 and I was 285 yeah. when I squatted a thousand, but like, uh, no freaking way. <laughs> one, one thing I wanted to touch on there, I know after I've had a, a power lift in me, I'm, you know, I, am, I want all the food. I, I you know, I want to, I, I want a good sit down. What was the recovery like, especially going from being a competitive power lifter to then, you know, a couple, uh, a couple more years after that as an, uh, uh, you know, an exhibition lifter and doing these challenges, what was your recovery like afterwards? Because obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, getting older as well what what was your recovery and all the experience yeah. that you had what what was the recovery side afterwards like i know so many people are like oh my god what was that like after you deadlifted it must have been so brutal or the squat and i'm like it was honestly really easy right uh because compare a single set at three reps to what i just talked about as far as intensity yeah yeah uh, week over week and it was actually one of the least uh, sessions. So the training was the hard part to manage recovery. Yeah. Uh, the actual day of was really uh, very easy. Yeah. And like for the squat, I actually was almost the opposite from an eating perspective because I've been force feeding for so long. Yeah. I barely ate for the next three days because I was like, oh my God, I don't <laughs> have to eat till I'm ready to freaking dry heave and trying to, or till I'm ready to heave and trying to hold it down. Yeah. Um, so it was actually a, such a relief and I dropped so much weight the three months following, because it's like, I've been doing that for a year, yeah. uh, just trying to, because guess what? A squat is not like, if I put on fat, it's, it's going to help my squat. People don't, <laughs> under, some people don't understand that. It's like, it's all about leverages yeah. and particularly the squat, like the deadlift less so. Um, but, you get into that hole if you got some belly pushing against your quads it's helping push you out like mechanically like like i'm gonna go for that and make it easier like that's my goal is, is uh to move the weight not necessarily you know to develop the strongest legs right obviously all that's gonna help so yeah. um so recovery was pretty easy i used a, a massive amount of recovery modality so from a from a session to session i think that's where you're kind of diving so yeah. um I really believe in, you know, getting back to a normal state as fast as you can. So relieving the, the tension, focusing uh, so that you're moving well, that we don't have, you know, tension pulling on a j- joint in a disproportionate manner, um, and then using movement as a healer. But movement's got to be clean. So that's why I try to get there as fast as possible. If you're limping around, you know, walking around is not healing. Yeah. But if you've got great posture, you're feeling good and, and you're just walking, that's recovery, right? Movement is a healer. So uh, because the sessions were so challenging, I would start that recovery process immediately. So right on the platform after a day squatting, I'd be on the ground and, you know, my, my soft tissue specialist was right there working me with the, uh, the Kabuki tools or myofascial tools. Uh, and then, uh, then I was, then I'd be ready to go. Then after that, um, it was a lot of, uh, daily movement, things to stimulate, um, uh, things to stimulate blood flow is like the biggest, uh, the biggest piece for me. Um, so it's going to be, uh, like I said, movement being one, I'm going to do uh, BFR work, uh, blood flow restriction. So I do a couple days of that leading in, um, and that, uh, some really light loading, 
but get some great effects from it, uh, stimulate that. Uh, I'm a huge believer, well, <laughs> the research is there, on the daily use of nitrates. Yeah. Um, so that's going to cause some vasodilation. It's going to enhance um, that uh, throughout the body flow recovery, all the nutrients that you're eating, everything that you're doing is going to be able to support that. Anything that you're putting into your body for a recovery standpoint, anything is going to be enhanced by doing this type of work and having, uh, integrating that supplementation as well, uh, keeping the muscles full going into a workout. So again, that was why I had the BFR workout in the days prior. Cause if I had only squatted once a week, I'd be like, I'd come in and you'd be flat. You'd have less uh, glucose, not just the glucose in the muscle, but the less filled out, you're going to be flatter. It's going to actually not be able to perform at your highest and increase the potentiation for, for, for an injury, right? Mm -hmm. So doing the BFR allowed me to fill out rapidly, uh, then combine that with uh, uh, the daily use of uh, nitrates. Again, is going to help you walk into this workout, even though you haven't been training every single day in full like you normally are in a training session. So that was an interesting thing to manage when we talk about training programs, because in a traditional uh, training program, you don't have to worry about that as much because yeah. you're training all the time. So you're always going to be full, but I couldn't train those other days because I was trying to maximize my recovery. But then that puts this other layer of like, well, now I've got this to deal with. And so those were some of the things. Um, always staying on top of on the movement perspective, the neurological inputs. So if I'm losing position, being aware of what's happening in my movement and in my assessments, um, but a lot of, you know, awareness things, things like, you know, some basic 90, 90 drills or dead bugs or things like that. Because for me, the easiest thing to break down was that pelvis to diaphragm relationship because yeah. I'm not 400 or 440 pounds. Like, you know, the few other people that have, well, I think there's some people around 360 that have squatted a uh, thousand pounds. They've got this massive core. I'm doing this as a much smaller frame and just yeah. any loss in that torso stability um, starts a cascading effect. It starts things happening in my hips and so on and legs. And so uh, that was my uh, most challenging is really staying on top of myself positionally and the things that are happening in that, uh, that area. Yeah. Um, so it was just pulling from all sorts of everything that I could. So I'd run the Mark Pro again for some stimulation uh, of, you know, it's all going to have an effect on that sleep. I just missed the most important one, <laughs> like uh, making sure that you're sleep, you're relaxed, uh, you know, so timing that, you know, in the, in the evening, I'd come home from, you know, those workouts and just, try to get into that, that, that phase, uh, and doing everything that you can with managing, uh, the things leading into that so that you can fall asleep, get the best sleep possible. Uh, and, uh, that's the number one piece on recovery that so many people want to overlook. And, you know, I, I, I slept probably 10, 11 hours a night, uh, through the, through that. So, yeah. Um, I think that's why people do forget about sleep. I think, uh, I, yeah, people forget. Like why. I even forgot to mention it's like the number one and I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> and sleep. But Yeah, I, uh, I always say that, that's why sleep's a form of torture. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it is important. And if you don't get yeah. enough, you know, um, it's going to do some, it's going to, it's going to have a, a, you know, a big, a big effect on you. Um, and from what you were, what you chatted about there about, um, you know, adding in a little bit uh, uh, more movement to help with, re with recovery. Um, okay. Obviously, so, yeah. Uh, the 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 longer you the longer you train over time obviously you are going to create a little bit more stiffness and tension within you within your body especially with the you know experience that you've that you've had on there how much do you um compare to you know the competitive powerlifting to then doing um just the one lifts how much do you challenge your movement when you're not working towards those lifts or how much variation in movements do you do because obviously squat bench and deadlift are, are very set movement patterns um how much are you going to challenge or work on different variations of movement when you're not working towards those lifts and now you know not as competitive power lifting? okay let me uh i'm, I'm going to answer that but i'm going to step a little bit back to the uh to recovery and summarize okay. uh, that again so um so sleep things that stimulate blood flow through uh movement but we're talking clean blood 
uh, clean movement uh, and supplementation, uh, and then neurological inputs again. So for, you know, choice movements that are going to uh, uh, allow for positional things uh, and address issues. So those are kind of the the pieces there. Um, and when I talk about um, the the tightness and stiffness, so we lasered my body every week. Right. the joint positions, pelvis rotation, orientation, all this sort of stuff. And that actually drove our soft tissue work. Right. If we started seeing the quads were pulling too tight, we'd work on cleaning that up and get the pelvis back, re-laser. And then, and then that gets to a point where everything that I do from a movement perspective is going to be additive. Um, so just anyway, summarize that down to some key points. And then also just using really, you know, some data uh, along the process, right? Yeah. Um, so I think the other one is when I'm not training for that, how much do I challenge those other things? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, right now, um, I work through, uh, basically the entire body, um, uh, twice a week right now. Um, I really, uh, believe that that's a really nice, uh, frequency to be, uh, to addressing things. Um, you know, everything's a balance of, uh, getting the stimulus that we need for adaptation. Uh, but you've got to add the next stimulus. Uh, before we drop completely out of ad adaptation. Uh, so, uh, you know, doing a full week is, is in my experiences for a lot of people too much uh, time where we've lost a little bit of that and going tighter can push a little bit based on whatever somebody's training history, other things you can, obviously people can even go to a daily basis. Um, but uh, uh, you know, three times, four times a week uh, starts putting, some more challenges where uh, now the adaptation uh, or the additional stress, the stress is accumulating at a higher rate than the recovery. Yeah. Um, so, so it's a nice general target for most people. And so that's where I shoot for. Um, you know, I spend about three days working through it, three different sessions to work through the whole body yeah. uh, and then repeat that six days. I'll mix a day in there. So sometimes it's a little more than a week, less than, you know, uh, if I've got a couple days just based on my schedule, um, so I don't have it planned every Monday is this. It's just, yeah. for me, it's the floating three days. There's days off that happen uh, that are usually uh, based on my schedule more than anything. And then I'll train whenever that permits. And that gets me uh, about somewhere around twice a week or pretty close to. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to um, touch on from there as well, because obviously um, you mentioned your best uh, powerlifting um, lifts, but then also the lifts um, that you've done uh, after uh, after powerlifting. And when people are looking and um, seeing that, you know, um, even after powerlifting, you've still got these, these big lifts coming in. What are your thoughts on um, people who are competing in powerlifting who, um, you know, have gone from maybe the open age going into sort of like master there's one um, and are still, uh, you know, competing. Is there a, 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 a diminishing return where at some point them uh, performing in powerlifting, there's a point where it might be they need to take a step back and, you know, would you recommend people focusing in one lifts or changing their focus of strength training a little bit? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, you know, my training partner uh, is my business partner with Kabuki. Uh, we started training together when he was 58, I believe. Right. And he was a few years back into training. Um, you know, he's somebody that went to school for it and was a coach of a college football team early in his career and took a little bit of a break. He was back. He was already competing uh, when we started training together. And he's like, I want to get stronger next year. And at 59, he was stronger. Right. And I uh, said, I, I want to get stronger next year. And at 60, he was stronger. Uh, and then it uh, said the same thing again in 61. And he has uh, continued to get stronger uh, through the years. But now he's at a point that he's not uh, necessarily getting stronger. Uh, he is turning, he's 70, 70 years old now. Uh, he competes as a 198 pound uh, drug free athlete. And he's got around a 550 deadlift, uh, 460 squat and a 300 pound bench. Uh, those are, those are raw lifts, yeah. uh, raw with wraps. Let me uh, clarify for the uh, people that uh, want some clarification. And <clears throat> so the only adjustments we've had to make with him uh, is, is, is knowing that there is some changes in recovery. 
right? And so he wants to continue lifting. He wants to continue setting records. But, you know, each year they may not at this point be as high as the last ones. But he's doing a really good job of maintaining his strength with the adjustments. I mean, for his 70th birthday, he pulled 550 pounds in his driveway because, well, COVID. Uh, yeah. So, like, uh, ain't too shabby. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Thoughts on, because especially. And so, so it's just been extending. It's just at playing with the parameters around frequency, uh, just playing around with frequency and dosing of, uh, uh, of training. So yeah. I think that's why, you know, as a, uh, as a, you know, a strength enthusiast as well, you know, that um, it's one of those, especially for powerlifting, one of those sports that you can keep, um, you can keep going at it. And it's not just a case of being strong for 12 weeks. You know, you want to yep. be strong, you know, all, all the time and progressing. One thing I wanted to touch on was what are your thoughts on, because obviously uh, powerlifting is quite a sport that's quite accessible. You know, you can go into a gym and, and, and get uh, uh, and get started. And obviously with social media now, a lot more information and coaches are a little bit more already available. What are your thoughts on people who are coming in a little bit late uh, into powerlifting? And, you know, because obviously when you talk about sort of new begins, if you like, you always think about people who are just starting out in terms of, um, uh, you know, going from like school or college or anything like that. Is that the same if you're starting later on or I've had previous or I've competed in other sports and then I get involved in powerlifting? Man, that is the beauty of powerlifting. That is why, you know, again, my partner is a great example, but I just love showing up to, to meets and seeing people that have discovered this at all stages of their life and past experiences because, uh, you know, of those breakdowns of age classes and weight classes and things of that nature, like it, it, it allows that entry point at any point. And, you know, I see people like, but that want to be really competitive and they're like, oh my God, I'm 32. Did I pass my peak? I'm like, I didn't peak till I was freaking in my forties. All right. Like you got, you got plenty of time. Like don't, yeah, even if you're at a high, you know, want to compete at a high level, like it is not something that you have to have been doing from a, from a, from a teenage uh, perspective yeah. to, to, you don't have to have like, ah, I had to hit it at 26 in my physiological prime. Well, guess what? Strength doesn't, is a lot more than that peak of hormone levels and all those other things, because strength is cumulative over time. You ever, people you know, the, the term old man strength is commonly used because it's a real thing. <laughs> we may be far past that 22 or 23 year old prime or whatever it is. I, I, I can't remember uh, where they call that peak at, but um, for the most part, people don't hit their peak. Look at a lot of the top records. They're by done people in the submaster class and usually uh, in the 35 to 38 year old time frame. Uh, and many in the uh, that that will actually go well into their early 40s, uh, up to 45 years old, uh, where people are doing, uh, you know, performing just like I did myself. Yeah. Um, it's a combination of all those things. It's also experience uh, because it is a mental game as well to manage these parameters, learning how you respond, maximizing all this stuff. It is so far all those variables play such a huge role. That's what makes it fun, right? Yeah. Yeah, make it, it squat bench deadlift are easy, but think about it as a game of chess. Yeah. Like, you know, for so many times I, I, I told people my goal wasn't to be the strongest person in the world or the strongest person in my class or whatever. It's like, what? Of course it's gotta be. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I, I, I meet people that are stronger than me all the time. I outlift them, <laughs> but their just brute strength may be stronger, but their technique is bad. They, so they're not recovering as well. They can't actually lift the move, the bar as much weight as I can, but they're stronger than me, but I can still move more weight. There are two different things and moving more weight on, on, on meat day, same thing, moving more weight year over year, same thing. So you can use, you can attack it from so many avenues you can just peer gut like emotion and intensity mentally putting in and managing your training parameters and out thinking everybody as far as programming and um and the techniques that you use like all this stuff 
there's so many other avenues that become additive year over year that go beyond just who has the most physical prowess. Yeah. That's a factor too, but they're all, they're, they all have to play a role. Yeah, definitely. And you, you, you kind of touched on something I wanted to chat a little bit about there. So you mentioned there about your peak or your prime and, you know, obviously, you know, you look at some of the, like what you mentioned, some of the uh, world record holders um, are sort of that sub masters um, category, but when we're, um, is that dependent on, because obviously you mentioned there about your recovery, about managing your training, um, about, you know, uh, challenging and working on your movement a little bit more. Is that dependent on all those things sort of taking care in the background? Um, or is it they can get to a, you, you'll get to a point where actually just that experience of lifting will help you, um, you know, reach that prime, if you like. Um, I think you lost me somewhere in that question, <laughs> but uh um, I think along those lines, I, I challenge everybody to do a, a little mental experiment next time they're in the gym, which I guess might be a while for some people, <laughs> but, uh, go walk in the gym and look around and you'll notice that everybody that's lifting is either in their early twenties or 40 years old and older. Right. Because they're not in there in this 25 to 40 year range for the most part, uh, because those are prime career years and child rearing and growing years. Right. And there'll be a huge gap. Um, so um, it also gets back to the point of you can start at any time. So if you have those breaks, don't be afraid to retake something that you lost for those years during that. Not many people can actually fit all the parameters of life. Um, because that is also another stressor. The body doesn't know the difference uh, between the stress of training and the stress of being up all night because your kid's puking and then get yelling, yelled at your boss the next day because you were late for work. Guess what? That's pretty intense stress, right? Yeah. Challenge of uh, marital relationship as you're dealing with, uh, you know, going through all that stuff. Too. All that is like huge stressors. Um, so, uh, not everybody has the ability to be able to really focus or even train during some of those, some of those years because of, uh, those other priorities and, uh, people need to think about training as a, in a, in a holistic fashion that covers all those bases. So yeah, that might feed into it. Uh, but anyway, it's an interesting thing to think about, uh, as you walk into a gym, because you'll, you will see it and, uh. And I know that, yeah, I, I, I was always training with people younger than me or, or older than me because I was one of the few people that made that as a priority and figured out how to still make my family as a focus uh, during those years as well. But, you know, I had to, I had to give up on a lot of things to make that happen. Yeah. Other things. Yeah. So, well, yeah, and that gonna... may not work for people. I'm not telling people to do that. Like you understand your life, your priorities and make the right calls. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like what you mentioned there about having a more of a, a holistic approach and we touched on it there that powerlifting, you know, isn't ever going to be anywhere, uh, go anywhere, sorry. And it is quite an, an accessible sport. And, you know, why I mentioned there about, you know, people coming in late to um, powerlifting. I've got a couple of clients who, you know, have watched or seen powerlifting on social media or strongman or whatever it be and, and got involved in it or have come back in, come back into it, um, which yeah. has been, uh, you know, quite interesting. I I love watching the older, mature athletes. We we don't use the word old. We use uh, <laughs> mature athletes in our facility because we do work with so many people uh, that are in that fifty-five plus uh, category uh, in our in our in our, uh, in our facility. Yeah, yeah, and you know, mentioning um, that you know, still getting stronger, um, yeah, you know, year on year is yeah, is awesome. Um, but from you know the couple of topics that we've chatted about there, the the final question, if you like is for everyone listening, what would be your take-home points or words and words of wisdom from what we've chatted about today? Ah, from what we've chatted about today. Um, words of wisdom. <laughs> uh, is, uh, we've caught, we've covered a lot of topics around um, variability in training, lifestyle, all these sorts of things, and really is understanding um, that 
just don't go pick some template and go, this is what I'm going to do. Consider all these factors about one, what are my personal goals? What is, you know, my prior experience level? What is my opportunity for recovery? And what is my lifestyle? Okay. So if you take those four things and really go, okay, what is the best match for me based on that? So for me, I've never followed any one really specific approach um, because of that. Like in those prime typical years, I train three days a week. People don't realize that like they're like some of the peak of my competitive powerlifting days. That's all I had the opportunity for. Okay. Before that, I was training six, seven days a week when I was young, dumb and stupid. Right. right? Uh, and then as I was able to position things better, I was able to increase my, my training frequency and getting up to, to four days a week, which not allowed for that hitting things twice a week and so on. So there's not one people want to try to find this perfect solution for here's the best training methodology and approach. And there, there is no template of perfection. The, the, the thing is to look at those values or those priorities uh, and those things feeding into those four different areas to help you understand what is the best choice uh, it, based on these variables and how you can put together an effective plan to realize your goals while accommodating uh, the resources uh, and availability that you have based on uh, your lifestyle. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a good um, take home point and some really good words of wisdom there to, to finish on, especially from what we've chatted about there that, um, you know, when we've spoken about all the other things and variables that you need to take into account, um, it just goes to show that um, you are going to have to change things and, and find what works for you at any given at, at any given time, um, really. And it's not always a, you know, a one size fits all um, model is always going to gonna work all the time. Um so yeah, thanks a lot, Chris, for taking the time to uh, to jump on. Um, been really looking forward to sort of chatting all things um, strength training with you. Um, but for everyone listening who might want to see the content or information or the products that you're putting out there, um, where can people find you um, or see the content that you're putting out there? Okay, so the uh, the best central hub for all that would be uh, my personal website, chrisduffin.com. So there's a link there to Kabuki Strength, but you can also, Kabuki Strength is pretty easy to find. <laughs> uh, barefoot, which is our uh, our minimalist shoe and f- human to ground interface. So toe socks, things like that. And then uh, Build Fast Formula, uh, which makes the supplementation. Again, Vaso Blitz is the premier uh, daily nitrate product uh, out there. Uh, incredible value tested uh, and uh so you can find all of that there. There's also my book, uh, which is a, it's a bestseller in five different categories. And it dives into the areas outside of physical strength, uh, covers emotional uh, and uh, mental strength, and really an inspiring uh, motivational piece that walks you through uh, some practical means of introspection and uh, to allow you to really find your path uh, and North Star in your life uh, while uh, having a, an incredibly inspiring, motivating story. So uh, there's a link to that, which is really cool because if you don't have an audio account, you can get a free audio download by signing up for it on that uh, on the site. You'll get my book for free and one other book for free. So obviously there's some incentives and stuff there, but it's a great deal. And that's why I promote it because that's, that is really, really freaking cool. Um, or you can find it Barnes and Noble or Amazon or yeah, all over the place, uh, whatever works best for you. Um, and then there's links to all that social media. I really encourage people to follow um, our coaching Instagram. We drop daily free content and it's incredible. It's probably the best educational content that you'll find a movement and loading out there. Uh, and that is Kabuki underscore virtual coaching on Instagram. Uh, and uh my platforms that I interact on is uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. So uh, actually that uh, if you're on LinkedIn, that uh, educational content's there. It's also on the Kabuki YouTube channel. So you can check that out. But uh, I'm Chris Duffin on LinkedIn and Chris was well, mad, Sci- mad scientist Duffin on Instagram. You just type my name in, in any social media platform and it'll show, I'll be the thing that shows up. So um, yeah. 
Awesome. Um, yeah, 100%. For everyone listening, if you haven't seen the work that Chris has done and Kabuki has done, um, 100% check that check that out. I know I've followed um, Chris's work, his podcast, um, uh, as well as the content he puts out with um, Kabuki Strength, and it really, really is um, helpful. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend 100% checking that out. Um, so thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah. And we have a podcast uh, yeah. duly noted as Strength Chat as well. <laughs> Uh, we haven't put out any episodes because we've been in uh, lately because we're changing. Uh, we've added a new facility and we haven't uh, set up the new podcast studio uh, yet, but uh, we will be back at it shortly. And there's some great, great interviews on there. Uh, so we we really find some great scientists and researchers and uh, coaches out there. So, yep. Awesome. Um, thanks a lot, Chris, for taking the time to chat with me. Really, really appreciated it. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did, and I will see you all next week.